Welcome to Paint a Beautiful Picture. Today's Saturday session, sadly, my guest was unable to be with me. She had to cancel just a little while ago. <laughs> so it will be just you and me. And I'm really glad to have you with me. I'm going to address a few things that have come up. And as I always say to you, please be, be happy to send me a message on the Paint a Beautiful Picture website or in below the YouTube comments or on Rumble so that I can address things that really matter to you. But I'm going to address a couple things that have come up as time has gone along and hopefully it will be of help to you. Ideally we'll have four 15 minute ish segments here and so you can watch them in part. In this first segment I'm going to talk to you a lot more about communication. It is daily a necessity and it is the means by which we tell someone else our thoughts, our ideas, our emotions. But just because we all have to do it doesn't mean we are all equally good at it or as good at it as we would like to be. And so I'm going to talk about communication with you just for a little while in this first segment. I want to acknowledge to you, I am by nature a communicator. It's a really big deal to me. When I was younger, I was pretty harsh. I was one of those, I'm going to tell you the truth and you can either swallow it or you can't, but that's not my problem. Once I've said what I needed to say, now, if you're choking on it or it's tough for you to hear, that's your problem. Yes, that was not always effective. <laughs> I admit this to you. And so each one of us has our own way of communicating and our own style and often we just expect other people to deal with it. That's the way it's going to be. And actually, you can do that. It just doesn't always mean that it's going to be the most effective way of communicating. One of the things that was a big thing to me as a kid was that my mother treated us all just exactly the same. I think it had to do with my mom's conception of fairness. And... Because of that, she never took any of our individual personality traits or our unique quirks or even uh, elements of who God created us to be into account. Just never even dawned on her to do that. Literally, I have to tell you, I have a good friend that has five children, and she does that very thing. She doesn't look at her kids as individuals. She hasn't gone out of her way to discover the unique things about some of those kids, and she just treats them all the same and acts the same to every one of them. And sometimes it causes real trouble, at least with two of her children, that aren't the same and need to be treated somewhat differently. And so, you can just do one cookie-cutter method of communication your whole life, and it might actually work for you. But I'm going to give you a couple of things that might help you to be a better, perhaps more effective communicator not just with your children in your home, but frankly with your greater family, with your friends and neighbors, people at church, and probably, truthfully, even in things related to your business. All right, here we go. One of the things that a lot of us don't acknowledge is the nonverbal communication, which has a lot to do in today's world with electronics. Because let me tell you something. When someone is sitting here like this, oh yeah, I'm hearing you. Oh yeah, I'm paying attention. Yes, I got that. Huh. I'm sorry. I'm just going to walk away half the time. Why in the world am I going to talk to you when you have zero interest in what I'm trying to say to you? And the answer is, I'm probably not going to. And so if every time your child comes to you and they want to talk to you and they're really excited, they're like, Daddy, guess what happened to school today? And Mama, guess what happened at my friend's house? And you're, yeah, I, I heard you. Uh, you are literally telling them what you have to say to me is not nearly as important as whatever this is. Whether I'm texting my friend or whether I'm looking at YouTube or Instagram or TikTok, this Is more important than you. That's a really strong nonverbal message. Let me show you a couple other ones because I'm just going to show you, okay? I was born with an expressive face. I'm not really a person that was designed to play poker, so let me show you. Your child comes home and he says, hey mom, 
guess what? Billy said, I'm a wanker. And you're like, you just expressed great displeasure in about half of a second, and he got that. Do you have any idea what that means, son? Well, no, not really, but I thought, I thought it sounded kind of funny. Yeah, that wasn't a compliment, okay? Well, they already figured that out right away from your facial expression, but it's more difficult when it's about them. Mom, I failed my test today. Oh, my word. How likely is this kid to tell you again? when he has a failure or he has a big problem, if all he's going to get is anger and disapproval. But not terribly likely, okay? And human beings all look for nonverbal communication. I want to tell you something. If you cannot maintain eye contact with someone, most especially your child, for an extended period of time, this is a communication skill you can work on. And it's called attentive listening. You need to look that person square in the eye. It doesn't mean you can't break eye contact occasionally. That's perfectly okay. But if you're constantly doing this and shifting your eyes all over and you cannot give that person your undivided attention, that's on you. You have a communication issue. I would like to say to you, especially as a young adult, you know, maybe somewhere between 16 and 25. If you were raised by a parent who was frequently preoccupied with electronics or other things and who did not sit down and give you their undivided attention, it may be a great challenge for you. This may be a skill you have not yet developed. And I want you to know that's not all on you. But honestly, by the time you're 14, 15, or 16 years old, you are now a young adult you get to make decisions about how you're going to live, how you're going to act, how you're going to communicate. And one of those things is giving someone the gift of your undivided attention. So learn to look someone in the eye, learn to listen, learn to close your mouth, which is a huge part of communication, and it is a skill you can develop. People who love to talk, oh my goodness, I have a family full of these and I would be among them sometimes have a really hard time listening. In school, we used to tell the kids, God gave you two ears and one mouth. It means you should probably listen twice as often as you speak. That's a hard one. I'm just telling you, for a talkative human being, even for me, that's a tough one, okay? You can, in fact, develop the skill of listening. And this is how you do it. You sit down with someone that you really love and care about. You don't necessarily start this one with your child. So your co-parent, your spouse, maybe even your mom, one of your best friends, and say, lately I've really had to look at this. I don't think I'm a good listener. And I'm trying to develop the skill of listening. So I want you to tell me about your week. I want you to tell me what you think about, I hate politics, but you know, a particular situation, or tell me what you think about this, this situation that's been going on within our family. Tell me about what life was like when you were a kid, if you're talking to your mom or your grandmother. And then I want you to sit there. I want you to look right at them. I want you to close your mouth, intentionally close your mouth, no matter how much you're dying to jump in there and talk like you normally would. I want you to listen. Just be quiet and listen. Don't think about the next thing you're going to say or what you're going to do next Tuesday or how boring this all is. That's why you want them to talk to you about something interesting. I just want you to listen. You might not be able to do it for more than three minutes. I kid you not. When I first started learning to actively listen, I don't think I could go more than three to five and really honestly just be quiet and listen. It's not an easy skill, but it's a crucial skill. I always use the language that it's a gift because it is. When you honestly love me enough to listen to my heart, that is a gift. Okay, so practice the skill of listening. Then this is where it goes farther. The next time, say you're having an ongoing meeting with your grandmother, because let me tell you, I asked my grandmother a ton of things. But by the time I was 22 years old, my grandmother had died. I didn't get to ask her very much. 
And I was always sad for that. I mean, my grandmother was born in the 1880s. She lived from the days when cars didn't exist all the way till there was a man on the moon and computers came around. Wowee, you know the things she went through in her life? I'm really sad I didn't have more time to get to know her. For that reason, I encouraged my kids to get to know their grandparents, and they took that opportunity. So let's say that you're going to establish an ongoing time with your grandmother or your grandpa, and you're going to sit down and talk to them an hour per Saturday. This is the next step in active listening. After they talk to you, you know, not in front of them, go out into your car and make a couple notes. Wow, okay, I'm getting better at this. Because the first few times you might not be able to say very much like, okay, I don't hardly remember because my mind was preoccupied. But when you're learning the skill of listening over time, you can start writing notes like, okay, I was, I'm doing better at this, at really paying attention and really actively listening and getting this information. It's amazing. Within 24 hours, often, we only remember 2 to 6% of what we heard. It flies away. We just can't hang on to that much. And that's where when you do actively listen and you even take notes, more starts to stay with you. Your retention increases. I want you to take that time, especially with your child, so that they know how valued and loved, I mean, how really, really important they are to you. Because active listening demonstrates value to any of us. Then I want you to learn how to speak clearly and accurately. Okay? All of us, me included, trust me, occasionally, as much as I've worked on this, I will still sometimes hear this come out of my mouth. For every one of us, there's going to be a different set of target words. Okay? I had a little kid in my, one of my classes, and I'd say, well, that was pretty stupid. And he'd say, oh, Miss Newby, stupid is a bad word. <laughs> I was like, not really. But okay, at his house it was. You have to determine the things that aren't okay. You know, I don't particularly like this word, but I'm going to say it to you because I'm going to help you know how much I don't really like it. I don't like the word crap. I just, anyway, I, I just, I can't stand that word. So I don't like it. And I don't really like the word dummy. Oh, you're such a dummy. You have to find those target words and perhaps discuss, especially with your mate, where those words hit you emotionally and why you don't really need to hear them or that you'd prefer not to hear them. So you can understand one another in communicating really effectively and meaningfully and without raising up red flags internally. Amazing, even little kids who don't have tons of experience in the world, they have words that just hit them badly. You need to pay attention to your child's nonverbal, or if they're a pretty verbal kid, they'll tell it to you. I don't want you saying that to me. you got to pay attention to that. You don't go around triggering people that you really care about. Like you, you learn what they don't like to hear, and you don't need to say it. There are lots of alternative ways of con con conversation and of communicating your thoughts without offending somebody. And that's the last place I'm going to leave with you. In communication... You don't have need for offense. Sometimes certain truths are offensive in and of themselves. And I, I just freely acknowledge that to you. And still, there are times you have to say the truth. Honest. To your teenagers, to your boss, sometimes to your good friend. You know, when you did that, that was really lousy. Okay? That injured our friendship. It was not acceptable behavior. I'm telling you, I'm not mad at you or furious, but I'm really reevaluating our friendship based on that. Yeah, that can be really offensive, especially if they're proud or kind of stubborn or don't like admitting, or that's just the way I am, they're defensive. Even with your children, sometimes those kinds of offensive things have to be addressed. You may not speak to me in that tone of voice. I don't speak to you like that. You are most assuredly not going to speak to me like that. Yeah, that can be real offensive to a kid. Well, I didn't think that was all that bad. Oh my word, I've heard some women just go down the road a long way with that piece of line. You're not going to tell me how to talk. You, you're right. But you know what? If I'm going to be in relationship with you, then I have every right to say to you, that was not acceptable. I do not appreciate it. 
And we can even say those things to our kids, and truthfully, sometimes they need to hear them. You also need to learn how to speak good things into someone's life. For those who, of us who haven't heard a lot of that or haven't had a lot of familiarity with someone who spoke life and goodness over us, those words might be really awkward for us. But we also need to learn how to speak truth, good words, gracious words, generous truth into the lives of those whom we love, our mate, our children, and our friends. I hope that broadens some of your understanding and perspective about communication. In this next segment, we're going to discuss something that keeps coming up as I talk to people, and that is about the development of an inner life. It's really fascinating. I go to the public library a lot because of the extent to which I read, and a couple weeks ago I had a great conversation with one of the librarians and shared about my channel. So maybe a week later, we saw one another, and this librarian expressed to me appreciation and, uh, you know, just a good feeling, a good sense of things from watching the Paint a Beautiful Picture channel. That's a part of developing your inner life. You need to find things that bring beauty to your soul and that develop you as a human being in your character and very honestly, even in your interests about life, there are things we're all interested in. I can honestly say, I don't think I've ever talked to a human, including a two-year-old small human, who didn't have something in which they were really interested. I'm not kidding you about that. Everyone has interests. When you develop those interests, when you discover more and more about them, so we'll, we'll take, a, you know, just a kind of a simple one that doesn't really have anything to do with me, but it does have something to do with one of my grandsons. When that kid was three years old, I kid you not, we'd be driving down the highway and he'd say, Granny, look at that BMW. I, said, I don't know what a BMW looks like. He'd go, what? How can you not know what a BMW looks like? And he'd start describing things to me about the body style and parts about the chassis. This was freaking me out. I'm talking to three-year-old kids telling me this stuff. He was vitally interested in cars since forever and ever and ever. You know, he had something like 400 Hot Wheels, and he still has them. And he knew the body style, and he, he just knew so many things. Cars have no interest for me at all. I can't even tell you what my friends drive. I don't even know what color half my friends' cars are. This is of no interest to me. It's of incredible interest to him. And it was when he was teeny-weeny tiny, okay? I'm telling you, everyone has interests. And so, you take your own interest, and you read about it. You watch YouTube about it. Uh, go watch different kinds of races, because there are some races you never dreamt of. It isn't all NASCAR, honey. And you watch what people do to cars and what they do to go-karts. And, oh, my lands, there's just so much involved in wheels and going fast. And I told you already, I like to go fast, so I can appreciate that part. Um, and I like good handling, especially on curves because I used to live in the mountains, and frankly, it's just really fun to go fast around a curve. And so, you start learning about those interests. Uh, how low to the ground does a wheelbase need to be in order to give you greater handling? Or how does the distance between two tires affect it? Or the width of a tire? I had a flat tire the other week, and I needed a particular size put on, and they didn't have it. So they put on the next bigger size, not significantly, went from a 185 to a 195. If you're a dude, you might know what I mean. So it was just a little bit wider tire. I was shocked at how much better my car handled. I'm like, why in the world wouldn't I have all four 195s on my car? No joke. But I didn't know that until they put that tire on my car and I felt how it's behaving when I'm handling it around a curve. Okay, so something you're really interested in, find out more. As I recommended not very long ago, go find someone who's an expert. Let them show you what they know or talk about what they know or take you into their workshop or take you into their mechanic shop, take you into their painting studio, take you into their kitchen. Do something that is of such great interest to you. It increases the value of your inner life because then when you're sitting alone, this is very true of creative people, but I have to tell you, I've known very uncreative people in the classic sense of what we think of that still really developed their interests 
and it enriched their life. That's on you. It isn't someone else's job to hand it all to you. Even in high school, let's be truthful. There are a number of classes which you must take. And then you get electives. Oh my goodness. You can go march in band. You can sing in the choir. You can take woodshop. Some things are allowed, even as a kid or a young person, to let you develop your interests and enrich your life. That's on you. And most notably, as an adult, it's very, very much on you. I get it. You have to go to work 40 hours a week, and oh my word, you're spending an hour getting ready and driving there, and then you've got to come home. I really get it. I know the details of life. You don't have to explain this to me and tell me how it's sometimes challenging to find time to do what really matters to you. But it's kind of a flimsy excuse. Here's why. All of us find time to do what we want to do. Now, I've told you before, I really actually like to play video games. I do. It's not a joke. Sometimes I'll be on my phone and I'll be playing, you know, I won't tell you the games I like, but I'll be playing a game. And two and a half hours go by. And then I'll go, Violet, that was really foolish. Because in that two and a half hours, you could have, for me, you know, made a whole entire doll's head or finished a whole, an entire couple of blocks in a granny square blanket. Like, wow, is that really what you wanted to do with two and a half hours? I'm admitting to you very freely that sometimes things get away from us. Our brains are overwhelmed. We're exhausted. This is the easy no-brainer part. I know that really well. I get that. But if you have little children, a family, and a job, oh, and a bonus material, a household to take care of, guess what? You have to get purposeful about your time. If you're going to enrich your own life, and it is going to take a certain amount of time, you can't be wasting time, or I guess I'll just use the language spending time on worthless pursuits. That's a, a place for a self-assessment for you. Okay, you can ask yourself the question, how much time am I wasting in a week? Because one time I did the math and I was really shocked tragically appalled because one week it was like 11 hours just goofing around now I'm older and I'm single I don't have to answer to anybody that's still a lot of hours no matter how you look at it okay so look at how long you're on that phone playing around on TikTok or Instagram or uh, Pinterest playing a game I'm not kidding you that may be something you have to give up because if you're going to have a rich inner life it's going to take an investment of your time and your energy to make that happen. Notice I've been talking to you a lot about your own self. It's because your children are going to do often, most of the time, what they see you do. If they literally see you take time and money and energy to develop your interests and pursue your passion, they are going to know that it is really very okay. In fact, it is healthy and good to pursue something that you are passionate about. And oh my gracious, there's no problem sometimes by the time they're six, seven, eight, and old enough to behave in taking them with you. Uh, my former husband likes to parachute dive. You're not going to find me jumping out of a perfectly good airplane, but he really liked it. And a couple times he took the boys. Now, they didn't go up in the air, thank God. That meant I had to go. Or one time a friend of ours went. They stayed on the ground. But they got to see all the process of putting on the parachute and checking the parachute and everything that goes with that. And they got to look into the plane and see the, I don't know that thing, what that's called, but there's a line that you're hooked onto that you let go of when you jump out the, the window of the plane. They got to be there for all of that. So he allowed them to share in that interest. I can really tell you, neither one of my kids has ever jumped out of a plane. It didn't convince them when they were little that that's what they wanted to do. But they got to participate in that with their dad. And they got to see what that was like. And it was, you know, it was pretty cool. And it was really exciting to watch their dad come down with a parachute. Uh, both of my kids actually thought it was interesting about hot air balloons. We went to a hot air balloon festival one time. Didn't really have much interest for me. But it was very interesting for them. So it's no problem for them to participate in something that you're really interested in and to let them have exposure to things. It helps them to learn more about being selfless with someone else that you love and participating in someone else's interest. And whether it does or does not spark something in them, 
It exposes them to more and more things. And the more we're exposed to ideas and concepts and activities, the richer our life becomes. So that exposure is a good thing. Let your kids go with you sometimes. They may not love what you love, but they can at least have the, in, the part of the joy of participating in what you were interested in. Lastly, I want to tell you this. To me, music is so beautiful. Everyone doesn't have the same opinions about music. Some people don't care about music a bit. Some people love movies. Some people love art. Some people love food. Everybody in the world, they have their own thing that really matters to them. But you can always share some of the beauty of those things. Someone doesn't have to have your exact level of interest to participate alongside of you and enjoy it. So I want to suggest to you in the development of a rich life together that you take what you were really interested in and share it with your mate and your children. And the opposite is true, that you show an interest in and participate with things that really matter to your mate or to your children. It doesn't just develop the rich inner life. It develops a rich life together. Okay, so you need to know what you are interested in and be willing to invest some time and energy in pursuing your interests because it makes you a richer and very truthfully a happier, more fulfilled and joyful person. And you also need to have your co-parent, your spouse, your kids, your grandkids uh, share with you what they're interested in and you need to participate with them. And so it really does give you a rich and a full life as an individual and as a family. In the second segment of our Saturday session, I'm going to talk with you about something that really impacted my life and that is near and dear to my heart. And I call it the disses. So, you know, someone will be like, don't diss me, which means don't show me disrespect. But honey, there are a whole lot more disses than disrespect. So we're going to talk about the disses in this 15-minute segment. This is a word I really like, disdain. It's kind of like disgust or disapproval. But there's nothing like that look that really lets someone know that you are just over all this, whatever this is. I'm telling you there are appropriate times to show disgust. The time my kid emptied his diaper and painted with it all over the wall, yeah, that was disgusting. And I guarantee that my face and my language showed it. Even though he was a baby, he didn't know what I was telling him, but I told him multiple times, this is disgusting, okay? But when someone is telling you about their life, especially about their childhood, they didn't grow up in a very functional home, and they didn't have parents who really loved them and cared for them. Maybe their dad abandoned their whole family and their mom did some things that were kind of questionable to keep them going. And you just get real disgusted and they know that you are. I'm sorry, that's not appropriate. They didn't do that. They were a kid. That was done to them. Okay. Disapproval. Oh, this one can really get me. Do you know what? I don't need your approval, frankly just so you know. <laughs> I'm pretty secure in who I am and what my life is like and what I do and what I know. But a kid? They're not. In fact, teenagers, they got to be some of the most insecure people on the face of the planet. Overall, they don't need tons and tons of disapproval out of you. And very honestly, neither do your friends. Just because your girlfriend wears jeans to church but you wear a really nice dress and you think that it's kind of like not cool to show up at church in a pair of jeans, why do you have a great need to express disapproval about that? That's your wardrobe and your preference. That's her wardrobe and her preference. What's the big deal? Oh, and guys, can we get real for a minute? Guys hand out disapproval sometimes like it is candy. I'm not kidding about this. Man, you drive a what? Look, the guy has four wheels under him. He can get to work. He's supporting his family. What's the big deal? You don't need to disapprove of that guy's wheels. It's just a vehicle, okay? 
But the one that really gets me hard, and I've seen it, oh, help me, I have seen it, is people who literally disapprove of other people's personality. And as we've talked about, you're born with your personality. You don't go out shopping for it. Like, it's kind of innate in you. So someone disapproves of you because you talk. Uh, you're probably born to be a talker. I'm not saying that someone, a parent might not say to you, you know, when we were there, you talked for three hours and nobody else could get an edge, a word in edgewise. We have to learn on your list, work on your listening skills. You have to learn to listen to someone else. I'm not saying that. I'm saying people, your friends or members in your family who just disapprove of you and send you the message that you aren't good enough. You aren't okay. There are things about you that are inherently awful and bad. This is not a message any kid or any friend or any family member ever needs to get. A lot of the disses I think most of us need to get out of our life. Let's talk about a really big one. Okay, we know my original family was, or more accurately, is dysfunctional. And I thought I was going to die laughing. My son was in a social studies psychology class. He came home at 16 years old and he said, Mom, did you know that our family is dysfunctional? <laughs> because as a parent, I learned to keep a straight face. I did. I said, really? In what ways? I want you to know. Every family is dysfunctional in some way. You can write that down. Write that down inside of your own internal script. Put it somewhere. It'll help you. Every family is dysfunctional in some way. I kid you not. The most healthy family where people really love one another, support one another, you know, go out of their way to be good to each other. They still have dysfunction. I've never seen a perfect human. And I certainly have never seen a perfect family there is dysfunction. And it is your place and your privilege as an adult to look at your original family, discover some of those areas where it was a little dysfunctional, and do better than they did. And to even help your children do better than you're doing now. That's always been my goal. I can really say it's awesome to see my grandsons. Oh, there's still dysfunction. Just trust me. It's part of being a human. But there's a lot less and so many skills and so many perspectives have been gained and changed. It's really exciting to see. Don't be paranoid about dysfunction. Don't go, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, my family, they're just awful. Yeah, girlfriend, honey, I can relate, dude. But that's okay because every family has a level of dysfunction. You need to work on that. You need to look at your own personal dysfunction. You know what dysfunction is? It means less than optimal function, okay? And nobody functions at optimal all the time, not a single person. So that's why we all have places to work. Let me tell you, the dysfunction of your family and the dysfunction of your mate, your spouse's family, yeah, man, they're probably not the same. So you're bringing your stuff and they are bringing their stuff. And oh my goodness, now you got a whole new batch of stuff. That's why it's very important for you to work on your own, not all over theirs, but your own and respect them as they're working on their own, and have discussions about what that looks like and what that means, and know the kind of family you are trying to establish, and things that you would like to eliminate, or at least minimize, in this new family unit. There are times that you can go back to your parents and say, man, when you blank, you know, that was pretty uncool. Like, that kind of messed me up in some ways. I'm bringing this stuff into my marriage. I don't want this. Your parents might get defensive, they might get mad, depending on their level of personal health. They might say, yeah, I know I did that. That wasn't cool, but at the time it was the best I could do. Okay. One of the things that's great about those kind of discussions is it can bring healing, because often healing is the beginning of change. So acknowledging that that kind of dysfunction was there, and especially if it was done to you or you lived through it as a child, it doesn't have to be your dysfunction, but you still might want to acknowledge it or deal with it respectfully. And then you can say, I'm going to tell you my language. You know I'm a Christian. I'll go to God and go, you know what, God? I can't heal this all by myself. So I'm asking you to heal this. 
And if I can't get the kind of relief or the kind of healing from this I want, then I'm going to go to someone else who's going to help me get healing. Whether that's a good friend I can really talk openly with, whether that's a counselor, however that happens. Because I'm committed to my own healing. You know, unhealthy people, and I'm talking emotionally unhealthy people, they often are disrespectful of others or disapproving of others. They often do have a good bit of dysfunction. And very honestly, there's a very specific psychological thing called disaffective order that some people have. It can impact us so very deeply, okay? So the disses, they are a part of life. But you need to handle them, and you need to approach them intelligently, and you need to do your best to minimize, and in some cases, if possible, even eliminate them. The one that needs to be eliminated out of just about everyone's vocabulary is disrespect. Every single breathing person is worthy of respect, all the way from a baby to the oldest human being. I'm going to leave you with this. My dad had horrible dementia. Because of that, there were a lot of ways in which he did not function when he was older, and it had a lot of implications. I have a friend who has a, who has a parent who has dementia, and there's a lot there that's not the same as when that parent was younger, and it requires a lot of care and a lot of patience. Even that person is worthy of respect. I don't care if they're sitting there and they don't have control over their bowels and their bladders and they don't smell very good and they have to wear a diaper and they drool and their food is all over their shirt. I don't care. They are still worthy of respect. I mean it. Get this down in your thinking. I don't care if that person's ideas are so radically different from yours. You cannot ever see eye to eye with them and you probably aren't going to be their good friend. And yet, they are worthy of respect. That means you do not speak in a manner that is demeaning. It means you are not physically abusive. It means you are not emotionally manipulative or controlling. It means that you, when possible, because you're in a situation where it is necessary, you hear them out, you are kind to them, you show them courtesy and respect. Do the best that you can to get disrespect out of your life. Don't be dissing folks. In this final segment today, we're going to deal with something that every human person has in common, and that thing is pain. There is nothing worse than watching someone that we love be in pain, except maybe knowing that we were the one who inflicted that pain. But it's very tough, and many of us don't even handle our own pain well. We certainly don't handle someone else's. And so, because it's such a big part of life, I think it's a good thing to get good at handling pain. You know, that is so easy to say. That is not so easy to do. So sometimes when our child comes to us and they said, Mom, you know, my friend hit me and my mom, my friend threw a rock at me and look at this daddy. He took that baseball and he did it on purpose and he threw it right at me and they got this big egg on the side of their head. You want to go outdoors and beat the kid down, but he's four, so you can't really do that. You know, we have lots of responses to pain, especially somebody else's. But we need to learn how to deal with our own. We absolutely need to let our children discover that we know ways to deal with pain and we're willing to help them with that. Physical pain, you know, that's not so bad. I mean, you put a Band-Aid on it, you wash it up, you take them to the hospital and get it set if they broke it. I've been through a lot of broken bones with my kids, so believe me, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, although I, I acknowledge to you that it's traumatic at the moment. But, I mean, kids who are active, sooner or later, many of them, they're going to end up with a broken something. Don't be freaking out about that, Mom and Dad. I mean, kids break especially just a broken arm or something, yeah, it's not worth you being all up in arms, <sighs> literally. Um, but what you want to do is help your kid understand that life is going to have hurts, it's going to have some pains, and we got to deal with this, all right? So you don't minimize it. Oh, it wasn't that big of a deal. Just get over it. Shut up. Get get up and get, keep going. Honey, that's just like, let's talk about dissing them like we just got done with. You don't throw it out like it never happened. It's a real thing. It really did hurt, okay? Even if it is just a big, massive scrape down their leg. 
And honestly, some people have much more sensitive nerve endings. I hate to give you the bad news. Those people might grow up and have fibromyalgia. And so things hurt more than the average person. Everyone doesn't have the same response to physical pain or hot or cold for that matter. And so you have to say to them, I'm really sorry you got hurt. Let's take care of that. Whoa, whole nother attitude, right? Instead of the kid needing to be, you know, he's going to scream and yell for an hour, so maybe you'll care. Or she's going to sob hysterically like, oh, it's the end of the world, you know, these little drama queen people. Um, if you acknowledge their hurt, yeah, I bet that hurt. Let's take care of that. They learn to put certain hurts into perspective. Now, they have a friend who lies to them or they have a friend who steals their bike or they, you know, they go through different kinds of things at different stages of their life and they're really hurt emotionally or their, their friend calls them really bad names and it really hurts them emotionally and even in their soul. And you need to acknowledge those hurts too. But you also need to say to them, I'm so sorry your friend hurt you. That was junky. Maybe you need to think if that's really actually going to continue to be your friend, especially if this is an ongoing thing. Perhaps you need to choose a different friend. I'll tell you, when my son was little, we had two guys, two young kids that lived on either side of us. And one of them was a really mouthy little person who was pretty rude and insulting. And one of them was mentally challenged, who didn't necessarily speak really clearly. And so they both had their own issues, right? And they didn't get along well with each other. My son would play with one or he'd play with the other. It was really tough playing with them in a group. And then, of course, my other son would often go along. It just really had a lot of group dynamics that were fascinating. And they would hurt each other a lot. These two boys were rude and insulting to each other. They'd beat each other up. My kids weren't allowed to physically fight. Just there was a lot of hurt going on. And I told my son, I said, listen, this is where we live. And we're not moving because of the neighbors that we have. You have to learn how to handle this. You would have to deal with the hurt that your friends can't get along. You're going to have to deal with the hurt that this friend who is mentally challenged won't ever quite be normal. And that hurts. You feel bad for your friend. I know that. You have to deal with the fact that this person, because of the home that he's living in, you know, he's kind of verbally abusive and he's not very nice and he's not inclusive. You have to deal with that hurt because you don't appreciate a lot of that behavior. And you definitely have to hurt over the dynamics of them, they're probably never going to learn to get along because even as much as you've tried to help them, the adults in their life are part of the problem and you, you don't have as much power as they have. I admit to you, all of this hurts. Yeah, you got to admit it. Don't try to cover it up or gloss it over. Or, oh, it's not that bad and just deal with it. Don't do that stuff. That's not good. If you really have a hurt, I mean, it's hurting you and your friend's like, oh, just get over it. You'll be fine. You don't like that. I guarantee your child doesn't like it either. That's not what they need to hear. I'm really sorry. I know that hurts. That doesn't cost you anything really, but you need to acknowledge and listen to their pain. Okay. We're going to go to deeper hurts. Betrayal. All right. I know someone who had a rough patch. They really needed support. And a friend of theirs, at the end of all of this, kind of attacked them, like really laid them out. That was about the last thing they needed. And it really broke the relationship for quite a length of time. It was a very deep and extensive hurt. It didn't help that prior to that, there had been other hurts along the way. And that brings us to an important thing. When you let hurts keep on accumulating, even if one person in there is willing to deal with the hurt, but the other one isn't. So let's talk about a couple for a while, just for a few minutes. You have a husband and a wife, and we'll say the guy's kind of a rough dude, you know, and he works, we'll say he works construction or he drives a truck. He's around guys all the time, comes home and opens a cool one, and he doesn't think anything about talking the way he's going to talk to his wife or his kids the same way he talks to all these guys on the job. And she's a lady. She's not one of these guys on the job. And those are tender-hearted little kids. They're not like the guys on the job. And they just keep sustaining emotional hurt from his insults or his rudeness over a long period of time. And she goes to him and she'll say, Honey, 
that was really not good. Or let's say she's not quite that healthy. And she's like, you are not going to talk to me like that. I'm not really sure who you think you're talking to, but that's not okay. And I do not like the way you just talk to the kids. You need to get out of the house. Just go on if you can't act right. Yes, we all re react to hurt in various ways. But if you let it accumulate and you don't deal with it and you just keep swallowing it and swallowing it, oh, it's going to come back. Because let me tell you, hurt grows. The hard thing is, in the mind or spirit of the person who did the wrong, it diminishes. And in the mind or spirit of the person against whom it was done, it grows. So when you don't deal with things, this person just gets more and more calloused, and this person gets more and more hurt. And over time, hurt often grows into, well, two strong things and one not so strong thing. One is anger. Oftentimes you find a really angry person somewhere buried in all, all of there is pain just so you know that. And it can certainly turn into bitterness. So you meet someone and they've been married 20 years and it's like, yeah, I'm staying with this guy because I told him I was going to do it and I'm not going to leave for the sake of the kids. But we don't have sex anymore and we don't do anything anymore. I don't really care if he ever looks at me again. Oh, there's a bitter person. <laughs> and then disillusionment. That person gives up. Like, it's never going to be different. I mean, it can literally go all the way into depression. But it starts off with being really disillusioned. Like, I didn't think this was what a marriage was going to be like. I didn't think this was what a home was going to be like. I didn't think this was the way my dad was going to treat me. So you have to deal with hurt. And that might re involve confrontation if someone can handle it. Frankly, sometimes you just have to confront it even if they can handle it you got to get it off your chest. When you talk to me like that, that really hurts me. You can talk to the guys like that, but oh my word, I'm a woman and I have the heart of a woman. That's why you wanted to marry a woman. And I need you not to talk to me like that, please. It's so hurtful. Really, some guys will be like, wow, baby, I didn't know. I'm sorry. Some guys will be like, man, I don't know what's wrong with you. Just get over it. Go talk to your mom. I've heard so many various kinds of responses, but listen, just because the other person who hurt you doesn't deal with it well, you can. I'm not kidding you. And it is not easy. I want you to know that. Forgiveness is not the easiest skill in the book for me. Yeah, I wish I could tell you I was great at it, but I'd be a liar because I am not good at it. Okay? But it's important. So listen to me really carefully. When you refuse to forgive someone, do you know what? It's like you waiting for them to die, but you're drinking the poison. That's where bitterness comes from, from that repetitive hurt and a forgiveness to, or a refusal to forgive it. So listen, forgiveness doesn't take two people. Now I'm going to prove it to you in about one minute flat. God sent his son to die for the sins of the world. And every soul was forgiven by God because of what Jesus did. But not every soul has received the gift of that forgiveness. But it was already given. Not when we asked, but long before we asked. And so you can forgive someone, even if they don't ask, even if they aren't sorry. And that forgiveness is not for them. That forgiveness is for you. So you literally can go inside of your very own heart and say, what you did, it really did hurt me. Don't minimize it. Don't try to cover it up. No, no. What you did, it really did hurt me. It hurt me badly, terribly, horribly. You can cry as many tears as you need to. And yet, I am not going to go through my life bitter and nasty and angry. I'm going to let this go and set it down and forgive it. If necessary, write it down 
tear that paper up in little pieces and burn it up. And as that ash goes, let that go out of your heart. Yeah, you can forgive without them ever being sorry or without them ever acknowledging or asking for you to deal with it with them. You can deal with it by your own self. The great advantage of getting good at dealing with hurt is you can help your child and you can even help other people. You know, I got to tell you, it is a great feeling to participate in someone else's healing. It really is. It's very, it's just a really good thing. It's very fulfilling to see someone who's locked down and bitter and who really has had a great deal of pain and see them find some release and some freedom. It's an amazing thing. And so I want to invite you to start getting good at dealing with both your own pain and hurt and those of your children. It's been great having you with me today on this Saturday session of Paint a Beautiful Picture. Please send me questions or comments. Let me know your thoughts. It would be great to hear from you. It will be good to see you again soon. You may find additional information on our paintabeautifulpicture.com website. Additionally, you may watch me on Rumble, and you may also listen to a podcast on Buzzsprout or Spreaker, all under the name Paint a Beautiful Picture. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. You may subscribe, and if you are interested in receiving notifications, please hit the notifications button.